He's a billionaire, a philanthropist, and the man credited with spearheading Africa's mobile phone revolution. Sudanese-born entrepreneur Mo Ibrahim set up his company Celtel at a time when mobile technology on the continent was virtually non-existent. And he was one of the pioneering entrepreneurs who believed we could do it. He took the risks, he could have lost everything. And that's what's unique about him. He's made his money ethically, he built a, in, he helped build an infrastructure in Africa which is now world class. In less than a decade, Celtel's customer base had spread across 13 countries. What Mo Ibrahim created could very easily be called um, the African dream. He built um, a company from zero revenues to one billion in just seven years, which is phenomenal. Having left the corporate world, Ibrahim is now giving the money he made from Africa back to Africa. He's got his eye on stamping out corruption and promoting good governance through the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. If you don't have the right governance, the rest, the rest disappears. He's doing this through the Mo Ibrahim Prize for Good Governance, worth $5 million. It's the world's most valuable individual prize. By putting Africa's good leaders in the spotlight, Ibrahim has set out to rebrand Africa. Because you guys only know about our bad people. You don't know anything about our good people. We have other Mandela's there you need to know about. We must show the world that some of them have been wrong, that some of them have misunderstood us. Born on May the 3rd, 1946, in northern Sudan, Mo Ibrahim was the second of five children. He had a modest upbringing in the Egyptian port city of Alexandria. I had a very happy uh, childhood. My family was, 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 was not rich, was middle class, which in Europe or America would mean working class. But, but it was a happy environment. Uh, uh, friendships, looking forward, uh, Africa was becoming independent, uh, you know, every year was a new independent country. We were looking for a wonderful future. At the age of 18, Ibrahim was offered a scholarship to study electrical engineering at the Alexandria University, followed by a master's and a PhD in the UK. I meant to be an academic, actually. I'm, I'm an engineer. Uh, by training and uh, I love engineering and I was looking for uh, an interesting life as an academic but then things changed I don't know for good or for bad but but they changed in 1983 he was hired by British Telecom as their technical director in fact it was Ibrahim's team that designed the world's first handheld mobile phone network but red tape meant the project never took off I found life very difficult we in, in BT I was treated very well I was happy I progressed we had a wonderful uh, system but it is it is to the big company mentality which in my view actually BT also failed to see the opportunity for Cellular. At that time it was the largest company in the UK. Cellular was just an add-on, something there. Uh, too much bureaucracy. In 1989, Ibrahim left BT, vowing never again to work for a big organization. He went on to set up MSI, or Mobile Systems International. And we started uh, this company which went on to design probably half the GSM networks in Europe. We did. Singapore, we did Hong Kong, we did Shanghai, we did Moscow, then we branched into the United States and uh, it was a, a wonderful uh, experience because I'm not, I was not a businessman. I mean, I, I just have to learn as a bit. I'm just an engineer trying to have fun and, and do what I know. In 2000, he sold MSI to Marconi for $916 million. In the process, Ibrahim set out to bring mobile phones to Africa leading to the birth of Celtel. We were probably the largest independent technical company, technology company in Europe at that time in that field. And we worked everywhere. The only place which we did not work or design networks was in, 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 in Africa. And we kept asking why nobody is, is doing Africa. And at the same time we get requests from Africa, from different countries, Oh, this technology, you know, nobody would like to come and try it here. 
You know, I met uh, Mo in the mid-90s. I was a Minister of Communications in South Africa. And the one thing that I was completely distressed about was that Sub-Saharan Africa had 600,000 cell phones. You know, less than, a, than the suburb of Manhattan in New York. And when I looked at it and said, we got together as African ministers, they said, what is the problem? And when we went back to our government saying, there's a revolution coming on, we need investment, they say, stand at the end of the queue, because we have to build houses and deliver electricity and water and sanitation. Those are the priorities for us as government. And so we looked at it and said, how do we harness this, this technological revolution driven by a private sector investment and make it happen in Africa? And we found very few takers, except for countries like Egypt or South Africa. And then I met Mo, who had been really successful in building mobile network infrastructure in Europe. And he said, I am selling up my company, and I'm going to go back and say, we can do the same thing in Africa. And he was one of the pioneering entrepreneurs who believed we could do it. With Mo Ibrahim, I think it's, it's I mean, he was in the UK, working in the telecoms industry, and he was quite senior in, in terms of where, where he was working. And then just seeing what has been provided in, uh, in, the, in the UK and seeing that, that those kind of services are not available in Africa. And so he decided to just step out and just be very brave and be very bold about doing business. In the 1990s, mobile services in Africa were at best scarce. In desperation, governments across the continent were even offering free licenses to firms willing to invest. But for many companies, the challenges of setting up shop in Africa outweighed the lucrative profits to be made. At the same time, we also in Africa have, have some issues. I mean, we, we, we think like barriers between African countries must come down. We're campaigning all the time for the freedom uh, of movement of capital, people and goods across Africa. That's essential. Some countries, some regions are making progress. The progress is not really uh, even around it, but definitely we are moving forward there. So that's something also will help. Lord Simon Cairns was head of the CDC group at the time, one of the biggest emerging market venture capital firms. He was later appointed as chairman of Celtel and worked closely with Ibrahim in getting the company up and running. And I, I know that Dr. Ibrahim tried to persuade companies he knew to come and take up the licenses which were uh, being made available. And when he was unable to persuade others to do so, he said, right, well, I'll do it myself. And CDC, the British government agency of which I was chairman, um, was the one of the major backers, and indeed, um, throughout the, the life of Celtel as an independent company. The success of Celtel was staggering. By 2004, it had six million customers, stretching from Lilongwe to Libreville. 90% of its 4,000 employees were African, and the company posted revenues of $614 million. The following year, revenues surpassed the $1 billion mark, and investors were starting to take notice. What? Celtel did for investors is that it became the poster child of private equity in Africa. For the first time, global investors sat up and realized that you can actually make money in Africa, make it legitimately, and make it on a pan-African level. Because usually, with uh, the perceptions of risk in Africa, investors do not want to go into just one country. They want to be able to build a business that you can grow across various countries because then you're not exposed to one political system and you're not exposed to one currency on top of all the other risks. For Mo Ibrahim, this was the dawn of Africa's mobile revolution, one that would change the continent forever. In 1990, there were just 14,000 mobile phone subscribers across Africa. By 2000, that number rose to 16 million. Today, out of the continent's billion-strong population, there are three mobile phones for every four people. Africa's phenomenal mobile boom can partly be attributed to Sudanese businessman Mo Ibrahim. He set up his company, Celtel, at a time when investors shied away from what is now the world's fastest-growing market for mobile phones. 
took the risks, he could have lost everything. And that's what's unique about him. He's made his money ethically. He helped build an infrastructure in Africa, which is now world-class. We have more than 750 million cell phones. It's now been harnessed to create enormous economic opportunities, to deliver banking services to people, to give them the right of communication. What Mo Ibrahim created in Africa is what could very easily be called um, the African dream because he built um, a company from zero revenues to one billion in just seven years, which is phenomenal when you look at Africa and also outside Africa. In, within seven years, he built a company from being worth zero to being worth 3.4 billion by the time he was selling it. Today, Africans aren't just using their mobile phones for talking. From banking to agriculture, mobile phones have changed the way people are doing business. You've got farmers now that are, that are in rural areas that are able to collect and make payments. You've got uh, people that are able to get um, medical help simply because they have a mobile phone. And you've got people that are, that are able to conduct business in a totally different way. I think mobile technology has re is, is changed the way things are done in Africa. As Celtel continued to grow, Ibrahim realized it was poor governance that was putting off investors and hindering development. For every corrupt politician, uh, there is at least a dozen corrupt business people. And who are they? Uh, we never question that. And uh, it is a global problem. It has to be dealt with globally. And I'm glad to see that we started to take steps with Transjibut laws around transparency and, 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 and ownership of shell companies and trust, because these are the vehicles for corruption. And it's time really to put stop to that. In order to ensure that no large bribes were paid, Ibrahim decided that no Celtel employee could spend more than $30,000 without the approval of the board. Uh, he made a, an understanding that if anyone asked for, for money, he would have to put it to his board, which included CTC, included the IFC from the World Bank and others. Uh, and, and the knowledge was that, that these institutions would not uh, um, let such a thing happen. So it was quite clear that he said, if you, if you wish us to make particular payments, we will have to put it to the board. Uh, in the full knowledge that the board would not sanction it. In 2004, Ibrahim announced he wanted Celtel listed on the London Stock Exchange, making it the first African company to do so. But with six firms bidding to buy Celtel, his investors couldn't refuse. In 2005, MTC Kuwait made an offer of $3.4 billion. Nearly 100 Celtel employees became millionaires overnight. This was something they were all in together and that made it exciting uh, for the employees, but also for the backers such as ourselves to see this great sense of a community which was working to provide a service that was so badly needed that we all understood just created a complete breakthrough for the company, for the countries in which they operated and which had such a remarkable effect. Ibrahim took his share to once again champion a cause that would better the continent's future. This time, he wanted to rebrand Africa by furthering good governance across the region. Mo Ibrahim has made a name for himself by going where few investors had chosen to venture before. Worth $1.1 billion, he kick-started Africa's mobile revolution through his company, Celtel. Ibrahim sold Celtel in 2005 to MTC Q8 for a cool $3.4 billion. The following year, he made the switch from businessman to philanthropist. He created the Mo Ibrahim Foundation to promote good governance and spur democracy for Africa and its people. We are two thirds of India, let alone China or the other, other people. So there's no excuse, there's no reason for us to be poor. We have a very rich continent, amazing resources. What we have been missing is just decent governance. And that's the same which we are discovering now. 
and people need to work now in order to produce this new Africa. It's going to be a long process. Countries don't change overnight. It takes years. And, uh, but what's important is step by step. Every year we need to go forward, step by step. And that will help them to start accelerate uh, our progress. According to Ibrahim's daughter, Hadil, the foundation's executive director, the transition came naturally. Just think if you know him as a character, he's a very politically aware and committed and engaged person. So whatever he does um, has that dimension to it. So of course, when running a company, there was always going to be a, some kind of political project about it, which was trying to run the cleanest company in the world, trying to run a company that sent a global standard for corporate governance. And so when he transitioned from the private sector to philanthropy, there was always going to be a political project about it. In 2006, Ibrahim unveiled the Mo Ibrahim Prize for Good Governance. At $5 million, it's the world's most valuable individual prize. It's awarded to former leaders who have worked towards advancing good governance. In addition, they're given $200,000 every year for the rest of their lives. Winners of the prize include Joachim Shisano from Mozambique, Pedro Pires of Cape Verde, and Festus Mahai from Botswana. I mean, if, if somebody rings you and says you have won a prize, when you are not expecting one, and you even know about the prize, well, the first person, disbelief and then elation, and uh, yes, that's what happened. The criteria is tough, and the prize isn't always awarded as seen in 2009, 2010, and 2013 has determined not to award the 2013 Prize for Excellence in Leadership. And we're not judging people on the basis of whether they did their job as a head of state. The award is for excellence in leadership, in the way they've built up social cohesion in their countries, the type of economic inclusion they built up, their, their personal ethics and values. And I think it's for exceptionalism in leadership. Most agree that good governance not only boosts civil society, but also the continent's economic prospects. The quality of governance, or, or lack of, uh, is largely responsible for the pure performance of African economies in the past. I am glad that the index shows that there has been improvement between 2000 and, and, and today. Uh, and various indicators have improved of governance. And perhaps that is why Africa is now doing well. The foundation also produces an annual governance index, ranking African countries on how they are run. So the criteria, we focus around four main areas. Safety, security and the rule of law. Rights participation, which includes all manner of rights from property rights, gender rights. Uh, Economic management, public management, but with an emphasis on sustainable economic management and with an emphasis on also the rural sector and then human development, health, education, welfare. So, you know, we see those four categories as uh, delivering a really accurate snapshot of the state of governance in the, in the continent. For Ibrahim, the prize highlights that there is more to African politics than just dictators clinging on to power. It also draws attention to the index and the issue of governance as a whole. We really need to rebrand Africa. We say, look, you need to know also about our, about our good guys. Everybody just thinks they know Mandela and that's enough. Uh, no, that's not enough. We have other Mandelas there you need to know about. Uh, so besides rebranding, etc., and the reward itself, we need to shed a light on the area of governance and leadership. And the prize attracts that attention on this light, etc. But we think the index is far more important uh, uh, work for us. It's a huge amount of work. And in terms of resources, it takes much more resources, human resources, uh, financial resources for us than the prize, actually. Uh, but we needed to have this accurate picture of what's happening in every African country. And then we give this information to civil society, to the governments. As the foundation continues with its mission, Leaders across the continent are also starting to pay attention. I found in the last couple of years that we end up with, we, we have a lot of meetings with African presidents. It's small, quiet meeting. 
And to my surprise now, when we meet a president, unlike in the past seven or 10 years ago, uh, it's totally different now because it's less small talk and pleasantries and photographs and it is more, uh, what can we have a look? at this area and we have to spread, we have to carry all the documents with us. We have to spread the and the president will take off his jacket and will start to work on the data. Then he'll call his finance minister, his health. They, they get involved seriously about what is happening, what is the picture. The prize and the index are also creating waves amongst the African public. I would say that um, we've definitely created some role models. Uh, people hadn't heard of President Perez, President Mukhai, President Shisano, maybe some people are there of President Shisano. So I think it's wonderful now that you have young people, because I think the significance is as much for African young people as it is for the international community. It's one thing for the international community to have a distorted understanding of Africa. It's another thing for Africans themselves to, to have that same distortion. And now you have this young generation of Africans who can look up to a Shisano or a Perez and say, actually, yes, maybe we aren't fundamentally corrupt. You know, we don't have to believe what other people say about us. Um, you know, our future is in our own hands. And I can follow the example of one of these, so far only gentlemen, and, um, and really do something positive and transformational. And I, I think that's, that's one of the most important things that the prize has done. In the late 1990s, Mo Ibrahim set out to connect the African continent. In helping kickstart the mobile revolution, 20 years later, it was mobile technology that galvanized political revolution. I think what mobile technology is doing in terms of helping governance is, I think governments realize now that people do not just sit back and take what they're given. They will get out, they will tweet, they will send text messages outside the country to talk about what is going on. I think we had cases in Zimbabwe as well where, where people really sat up and used the mobile phones to, um, to get the message out. In terms of changing governance, um, it may take a bit of a while, but at least governments are now aware that people are just not going to sit back and take what they're given. Ibrahim's ultimate goal has been to play a positive role in bettering the African continent. Through his work with Celtel, and now his foundation, he certainly has reason to be optimistic. The young people in Africa uh, are different from my generation. They are better informed, better educated, and more important, they are better connected, they're able change views, organize themselves. There's no more secrets in Africa. People know everything. So things are improving. Nothing like transparency, which keeps everybody in their toes. That's really important. So I, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic.